Hello and welcome back to the lab. Today on the bench, we have the last of the big three for doing scope calibrations. This is the leveled sine wave generator, the SG503. For those who have been following the channel for a while, this has been appeared in several videos. The magic behind this unit is as I change the frequency, the voltage doesn't change. It stays level, hence the name leveled sine wave generator. Good for bandwidth testing and a couple of other things. This is a not an A variant. I'm not even sure if they made an A variant, but it does have the new front panel design style. So all in all, good unit. This one's a little funny because it does need a special cable. You can use an SG-503 without the special cable. The thing is, you can't. You should not calibrate it without the special cable. There, it'll induce some error in the calibration given the output impedance not being correct and it can induce and it seems like I'm splitting hairs on this one but the, even the service manual calls out and says it can I think it's up to 3% error is what not having the right cable can be the other thing is this gets into when is a 50 ohm BNC cable not a 50 ohm BNC cable in this case they got around this on the SG-504 with the leveling head. This one doesn't have a leveling head. And what you find out is a normal 50, 50 ohm cable comes in at like 49, 49.5. This shipped with a precision 50 ohm cable, plus minus 0.1%, if I'm remembering the numbers correctly. So one of the reasons why I told the owner... Since you're sending the other two plugins for me to take a look at, uh, he does not have a seven and a half digit multimeter to check in the PG. I also have said special 50 ohm BNC cable. I only have one, uh, and I don't really use this for the calibrations because it's not necessarily needed because the exact output amplitude is not needed. The fact that it's leveled is what's needed for the scope cows. But for this dial accuracy to be correct, you do, well, within specification correct, you do have to use the special cable. Also, not putting any extensions on the cable because that'll change the normalized impedance. However, very rarely that I'm using this function generator or signal generator do I care what the absolute dial setting is. Actually, I can't think, I can't recall a time where I was like, where I said I need one volt peak to peak exactly and that's it so for the scope cows and things like that you do not need the, the special cable if you're going to adjust one you should have the special cable or just know that you've paired the unit with that cable when you did the adjustment because any error that that cable had you've now adjusted in to the leveled sine wave generator. So if you're doing this in your in your own lab, you can actually get around it. You do not need this at all. I recommend it if you're doing an adjustment, but in normal use, don't worry about it. So let's get into the unit, see what we're up against. Tech was known for doing design changes without changing the part number or the uh, model number. So we'll see. Oh, that looks quite a bit different from mine. That doesn't. Okay, so we have some of the really, here's some high speed transistors here. This is a, this is the attenuator block. Hoping I can get away without taking that off. That would be nice. Nope. To do one, I'm going to need to pop that off. Someone's been in here. There's a screw missing. That wasn't me. I haven't opened this up yet. But actually, now that I'm looking at it, this doesn't look like it's terrible to take apart. One connection here, one connection here, this connection here, and the whole thing should come out as one block, so that'll be 
easy enough. That'll expose the capacitors that I need to get to, mainly this guy here, that guy there. Actually, this can be done without it. This one will need that removed. Timing crystal is here. This switch will want to service. Cam switch will want to service. We don't want to do much to the um, slicer capacitor. That's going to be okay. Oh, yeah. we To get at these capacitors up here, we're going to need to get under that attenuator block. So in doing the capacitor refresh on this, we will need to remove the attenuator block, which won't be... This one's not going to be terrible. Checking the flatness on one of these gets a little funny and complicated. This is the peak-to-peak -peak de detector that tech calls for to check the flatness on one of these units. If you get one of these from the usual sources, assume they will not work. Didn't know this when I bought this, but this particular number, 067625. See if the camera will pick that up. Come on, focus. There we go. Uh, this particular unit runs on batteries, and I can almost guarantee you when you get one, the batteries are going to be dead. Uh, essentially, this is a rectifier and then a peak-to-peak -peak detector. The rectification diode's in here, and this also, if I remember correctly, goes up to 1 gigahertz, a little bit north of that, so it can check the SG504. Uh, to do the flatness test, I've, I was using, at least when I did it on mine, because... I'm still trying to work out a battery solution for this guy. I did it with the DSA602. Now, I have a 1 gigahertz plug-in. This only goes up to 250 megahertz, so I'm not on the 3 dB curve as the frequency goes up. So it did give me good measurements. The problem is using a slower, slower scope, especially if you approach the top end bandwidth of the scope, you start in that 3 dB curve where the amplitude is going to be dropping off based on the vertical response of the input of the scope, not necessarily dropping off coming out of here. So you need to greatly exceed, if you're going to do a flatness check, not really a calibration, we're not using the appropriate tools, but it is checking it and ensuring that it's working and not at least out into space, you need to greatly exceed the bandwidth that you're um, of 250 megahertz to get that done. I'm exceeding that by about 4x, given the fact that I'm using a 1 gig plug-in. We will be doing that to check this one in as well. That worked well. I took a lot of data points. I think I took every 50 megahertz as I cranked up the frequency. I watched the amplitude to make sure it wasn't breathing uh, on the scope. That's, that's um, rising and falling. The amplitude's not going up and down. And that gave me a data points map where I could calculate the peak-to-peak -peak within the parameters of the DSA-602, which is actually pretty good. Yeah, so one other thing to note is even the manual calls out for it. If you're going to do an adjustment on one of these, there's a whole lot of coils and capacitors on the back of the switch that are adjusted during the calibration. If these are in spec, do not try to improve them more. Everything interacts with everything on this board, and if one gets way out, it can be a long adjustment to get it back in. So um, when running through the calibration procedures, especially on this particular unit, verify it. If it's good, it's good. Leave that one alone. <laughs> Uh, to verify that, you will actually need a spectrum analyzer. I'll be doing it on the uh, E... 44, what is this thing? An E4411B. Because they do want to check some distortion measurements. It's not ultra low distortion like an SG505 or 502, but they want to make sure the distortion is not out of control on the oscillator's output. So with all of that being said, I'm going to tear this attenuator block off, put that to the side so it doesn't, uh, so nothing will fall on it. Then we're going to do some capacitor replacement, get this thing ready for the next 20 years of life or more, and go from there.
it is always way more tear down than it should be. So I was trying to get this out. I have to be really careful not to touch this board. There's sensitive stuff on here. This is the main switch attenuator, peak peak detector. I was trying to get this out without removing this RF shield and exposing everything under it. Well, there's two screws under there. You have to take out that screw. These screws don't need to come off, but it bolts to the chassis frame because that's the heat sink for this transistor. So a couple disconnections, lots of screws. You also need to loosen up the back of the frame because this needs to pop up to make room for it to slide out. But we're out, and I've got, ex I've got all of the capacitors exposed now, so it's just a matter of swapping the caps out. That is not a huge deal. The desolder tool will make that pretty quick, so I'm going to start take some pictures of that so I can get the caps back in the right orientation. Don't want to uh, piss off anything uh, electrolytic. And um, I think we'll be good to go. But we'll see what we have for capacitors and what we have for replacements if I have to order some stuff. We will. It'll just delay the repair. Wow, we have a bunch of capacitors replaced. That took about an hour. Um, everything was upgraded to 105 degrees C. Everything was at least equal or better to what was there in terms of capacitance and voltage. I didn't have any 33 microfarads, so 47s went back in. But everything got a voltage bump um, just because physical, as technology improved, they got smaller, but the voltage withstanding got higher, so we're able to do that. I need to get the um, attenuator board back in, everything hooked up. Then we'll fire the thing up and make sure there's no smoke. Okay. I have the unit set up for half a volt of output at its reference frequency of about uh, 5 kilohertz. We're on the no attenuation and the variable scope is set up. Uh, triggering is AC auto. We are DC coupled and we're 0.2. Let's see, we'll get some readout going here so you all can see the fun stuff. 500 microseconds of division and two millivolt, 200 millivolts. So, I have the side panel on this side. This side's open. If anything goes catastrophically wrong, it's going to come out this way because that's the side that all the caps are on. Let me apply some power. And if I did my job right, this won't go sideways. All right, I am ready for power. We're running, lab's running around 121 volts AC right now. But here we go. We have sine wave. And nothing is sizzling. Let's speed this up. There we go. Oop. Wow, that's nice and stable. Okay, so what we're going to do now is that's working. I'm going to move it up to the Rigol just for screen burn in and we were 50 ohm terminated so I'm gonna move it up there let this burn I'm gonna put the side panel back on it let this get nice and hot and burn in for the rest of the night and for those who have been around the channel for a while it's gonna run the bench for a couple of hours if it does that and nothing exciting happens and by a couple of hours I mean five six seven ish hours if nothing exciting happens, then we're going to go through and do the check the alignment. Once the alignment's good, it's ready to go back home. Okay, I have finished the calibration and alignment. This one did not need much. The voltage rails were fine. Had to adjust a little bit on the uh, dial for the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude. Other than that, everything was pretty healthy. I have here on the spectrum analyzer the 100, uh, 100 megahertz fundamental at 5.5 volts peak to peak. That's uh, within the range of my spectrum analyzer input. So we are good there. I did have to tune the reference level down so it didn't overload the mixer, but everything is good. We can actually see the harmonic suppression and I have the sweep going out to 1.5 gig. So if we hit measure 
and total harmonic distortion. This will go through and it will measure, I think it's either 9 or 10, uh, 10 harmonics because we can go up that high with this spectrum analyzer. And we have a THD of 0 0.78, which is perfectly healthy for this SG505. Or no, this is not a 505. This is a SG503. Wow. Yes, I do have the right service manual open, and I am aligning the right device. My brain is elsewhere. All right. Uh, the other fun one. I'm going to move to the bench, and uh, we'll take a look at a piece of paper. Here is some data from doing the alignment. I checked this with the DSA-602. So the absolute accuracy is not critical here. The deviation, or the, uh, because this is all checked on the same instrument, the absolute value is not what's important, but the deviation. So we have a minimum of 5095. We have a maximum of 5142. This is 5 volts and 142 millivolts peak to peak. That gives us a peak to peak deviation of 0 0.047 at a set point of 5 volts with a peak to peak percentage of 0.94%. That is within our 1% tolerance. So this particular unit is hitting specification. Thanks for stopping by the lab today and taking a look at this SG-503, getting this ready for a viewer. This completes his three calibration plugins. If you have interest in some of these plugins and you're just finding the channel, in, back in the video catalog, there is a detailed alignment and calibration of all three of the units that were just shown, uh, the big three that you need to calibrate a scope, as well as many videos on scope calibrations and lab setup and things like that. So if this content is what you're looking for, hit the subscribe button and stick around. More is always on the way. And as always, I will see everybody in the comment section in between videos. That's it for right now, and I will see everybody next week.